Hi, good afternoon. How was lunch? What time is it right now in Taipei? Oh, no, don't answer that. Don't answer that. Don't think about that. Don't think about it. Please. <laughs> yeah, you're looking very good for 2 a.m. Hey, uh, let's all give a shout out to President Emeritus Robert Easter, who's here with us. <laughs> Bob is probably our most internationally traveled uh, president from the University of Illinois. He's, he, has <laughs> he has great connections uh, uh, in Asia, and um, it's, I, I think I ran into you in Taipei two or three times while you were president. Um, so you, great, great connections to NTU. So it's, it's wonderful to see you here. This afternoon, we are going to work so hard. <laughs> we're going to have this lovely lecture by Wendy Rogers. And then after that, we're going to go back to our breakout sessions. When, uh, when that's over, we're going to meet right back here. And one person from each of the breakout sessions is going to be responsible for giving a short report. So for instance, in the session I'm in, uh, Jun Yen Jung will give the, the report. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for volunteering. Uh, so good of you. Would anyone else like to volunteer? Mark, you'll assign someone in your, I mean, you'll uh, elicit a volunteer in your section, and others will do the same thing, OK? Uh, I'm not going to introduce our speaker, uh, Elizabeth. Liz uh, Steinmoral. Liz is uh, uh, my co-conspirator in this uh, effort. Uh, she's been on the steering committee. Uh, she's a professor of educational psychology. She is um, <laughs> an expert in healthy aging, and indeed, she's been the associate editor of um, the psychology of aging since 2011. And about to be editor. Yo! <laughs> That's a, plug, that's a plug for the journal. <laughs> Elizabeth. <laughs> yes, it's, it's a great pleasure to introduce Wendy Rogers. I think of Wendy as my little sister because we came out of the same graduate program. She's just a little younger than I am. <laughs> but, but it's just been a really a gr a great pleasure to watch Wendy grow up in the field. I, you know, I watched her as a wunderkind <laughs> doing really wonderful experimental work and, and really influencing the field. And I've watched her to grow up to become a force of nature in the field. Um, and so now she is um, an endowed chair. So she's the Khan Professor of Applied Health Sciences um, in, in, applied, in Applied Health Sciences and in, in the Department of Kinesiology and Community Health. Um, she's the Program Director of CHART, which stands for Collaborations in Health, Aging, Research, and Technology, and the Director of the Human Factors in Aging Laboratory. She is a Fellow of the American Psychological Association, the Gerontological Society of America, and the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society. Um, she has been the editor of um, Journal of Experimental Psychology Applied, and now she has transitioned into being my chief advisor <laughs> as the a chief editorial advisor for, for um, APA. So I, I've, I've heard Wendy give talks, and you're in for a great treat. So please help me welcome Wendy Rogers. Thank you, everybody. I'm really delighted to be here and to have been asked to speak to this group today. I have had the opportunity to visit your beautiful country. I went to Taipei for the Geron Technology Conference that was held there in 2014. And I had had a graduate student visit me from um, Taiwan, and he's now on the faculty at Fo Guang University. And he invited me there to speak, so there I am with his students in the industrial design program. And I can echo what we heard this morning. I ate very well when I was there. My research goal, um, I classify just in a one sentence, is to provide support for successful aging. And this slide really demonstrates um, why this is so critically important. So the blue line is children under the age of five. And what you see is that that's relatively flat out through the year 2050. The green line is people over the age of 65. And you see that growing in a remarkable way. 
And by the year 2050, that's going to be 1.5 billion people, which is obviously a huge number. And this population aging is going to have wide-ranging effects on our healthcare system, our social systems, and our economic systems. This graphic is showing a similar pattern, but for different countries. Um, the red line here at the top is Japan. I want to highlight <laughs> Taiwan, because what you see is this is the green line, and that is showing the fastest increase in the number of older adults. Right now, it's roughly 4.7 million, and it's going to nearly double by eight to 8.8 .8 million dollars by the year. A million dollars, that's funny. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a funny slip because it does translate to economic challenges. 8.8 .8 million people by the year 2050. What's also a positive, though, is that the life expectancy in Taiwan is continuing to grow. So the orange lines, we still live longer than the men. The orange are the women and the blue are the men, but it's a positive trend. So <clears throat> people are continuing to live longer in Taiwan, <clears throat> excuse me, and <clears throat> elsewhere in the developed world. So when I think about supporting successful aging, I think of different categories of things. Functioning effectively and independently, maintaining personal autonomy, retaining and enhancing abilities, managing health, both chronic conditions and wellness, and importantly, remaining socially engaged and participating in one's community. So the theme of this conference is about aging in urban environments. And so one aspect that's very relevant to our discussion is this idea of aging in place. And this is the definition that I borrowed from the CDC. And the idea is that we need the ability to live in one's own home and community safely, independently, and comfortably, regardless of age, income, or ability level. And it's important for us to remember that people live in a lot of different places. So here are just a couple of pictures of homes in the US. They vary widely. I also found some pictures of homes in Taiwan, and they also vary widely. I love this one here. This looks really cool. <laughs> So we need to think about where are people living, the environment that they're living in. And even people who are living, quote, independently may receive assistance. So these data are from the US, a number of people who receive home care, what they're getting help with. And it's what we call activities of daily living. So th fundamental things, bathing, dressing, toileting, walking, transferring in and out of the bed or the chair, and then eating. So these are basic fundamental kinds of activities that people who are still living alone in the community are getting some assistance from. Maybe it's informal assistance from their family members. These data are people who are getting formal assistance from home health care providers. We also have to recognize that many people over the age of 65 are going to be dealing with chronic health conditions. Again, these data are from the US, but they're fairly generalizable. And most common are heart disease, hypertension, arthritis, diabetes, and any form of cancer. So older adults may be dealing with these health conditions. So one thing we might think about is how might we use technology for aging in place. So I like this definition. This is from a, a British colleague of mine, Sebastian Peake, and he talks about different parts of what technology for aging in place might do. And I want to highlight a couple. One is alleviating or preventing functional or cognitive impairment. So alleviating it for those people who already are experiencing some changes, but then also thinking about how could we prevent it so that it doesn't occur or doesn't get worse. Another aspect of where technology might play a role is limiting the impact of chronic diseases. And third, which I think is really important that we sometimes forget about, is the importance of enabling both social and physical activity. We're learning more and more these days the importance of social connectivity, social engagement, and how relevant that is to mental health, but also physical health and long-term outcomes. So I try to take a very broad view of successful aging, and I think about 
Activities of daily living, which we've already discussed, bathing, eating, drinking, and mobility. Um, I'd like to, my parents are no longer with me, but they're in all of my presentations, so that's my dad and that's my mom, say hello. <laughs> Another category is what we call instrumental activities of daily living. So preparing meals, paying bills, managing medications, and maintaining the home environment. So these are very important components of being able to live independently or to age in place. Whether you're doing it yourself or getting some support from somebody, these are things that have to be done. But we also talk about another category which we call enhanced activities of daily living. And this is more what I think of as the quality of life types of things. So social communication, hobbies, new learning, continuing to work or volunteer, and being engaged in the community. So when we think about what kinds of technologies we're developing to support successful aging, we should be thinking about all of these different categories of activities. So I direct, as was mentioned, the Human Factors and Aging Laboratory. And human factors is the study of the characteristics of people and their interactions with products or environments or with equipment. It's thinking about their needs and capabilities when we're designing systems or devices or when we're designing training programs or instructional materials or entire environments, thinking about that interaction between the person and what it is we're trying to develop. So the shorthand term for human factors is designing for human use. And I'm not sure what is the more common term in Taiwan, but um, the term ergonomics is also used to refer to human factors. In the United States, human factors is the more common. And in Europe, for sure, ergonomics. I'm not sure about Asia. Maybe a few people nodding. OK, so when you see human factors, think ergonomics. My lab is focused on human factors in aging. And so here, we want to understand the abilities, the limitations, the needs, and the preferences of older adults, and use that information to design, and I think this is important, we don't just design for older, older adults, we design with them. So they're very involved in the design process. And the goal is both usable and useful products and systems. Making sure that we provide appropriate training and instruction, and then we've designed it, we can teach people how to use it, how do we get it out there, right? I think we don't always go to that level. Thinking about deployment and introduction into people's lives so that they're able to integrate it into the way they want to do things. My lab is funded by the US government and it's part of two different centers. So one center is called CREATE. This group has been together since 1999. So it's psychologists and industrial engineers working together. And it's focused on research and education on aging and technology enhancement. Most of our focus is on what we call normative aging, what we can expect to happen to all of us as we get older, and designing technologies to support those individuals. The other center is a relatively new initiative that started in 2013. And this is technologies to support successful aging with disability. And here the focus is on people, we have three categories, people who are blind, people who are deaf, or people who are mobility impaired for most of their lives, and then they're now getting older. And how might we design technologies to support them? It's a very underserved segment of the population. So I know one of the things we want to talk about today is collaboration, so note, we're always looking for collaborators um, in these two different centers. What I want to do is just briefly go over a couple of different research projects that we're currently working on. First is the category called Extra Games, which you can think of as a game that supports physical activity. So they're video games that might promote physical activity and as a result may have physical, <coughs> cognitive, or emotional benefits. So in this first study, we looked at extra game programs that were developed for the Microsoft Xbox 360 with Kinect, one of which was a Tai Chi. We heard a little bit about Tai Chi earlier, Tai Chi game. And we brought older adults in. So here's one of our participants, and she's, trying, she's playing the game. 
and we videotaped their interactions. One was a camera behind them so we could see what was on the screen. So this is what they're supposed to be doing. This is what the fellow is doing. And then one was looking at them to see what their reactions were. We found that the older adults that participated in our study loved it, right? They thought that these were great. I could see doing this for physical activity. This is a great way to keep active. I can do it at home. Really very positive about the potential usefulness of these technologies. But they all had a lot of difficulty starting and playing the game. So we had everything set up for them, but just getting it going and knowing what to do. And they had particular difficulty with the gestures and understanding what they were supposed to be doing. So my team was an interdisciplinary team. So we had human factors, aging, and an industrial design PhD student. And she said, well, I can develop something to help them. So she developed a quick start guide that provides troubleshooting tips and steps for getting started. But then most importantly, what she wanted to focus on in her study was how do you teach them how to do the gestures? So this study is in process right now, but what she's designed to compare is three different ways of teaching people about gestures. One is what she called self-identification. And this is, her name is Christina Harrington, the person who did this work. And she developed um, photo images of other older adults. So if I see other older adults doing it, maybe it would be easier for me to understand what I'm supposed to do. Second was, she's labeling this one a simplicity version, where you just have an outline of an avatar showing you what you're supposed to do. And then she's comparing this to um, things that are often in instructional materials, which are really more animated hand images. These may be familiar because you see them, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily good at teaching people what they're supposed to be doing. The other challenge, if you're developing a user guide, well, these people are up there doing stuff, right? They can't be holding it in their hand. So she designed a tabletop version, big print, so it's over here and they can be looking at it. So this study is, as I said, in process, but I think it's important to remember whenever we're talking about technologies, they love the idea, but the implementation wasn't working well. And so we may need to mediate that by providing some kind of instructional support. The next project I want to tell you about is called the MEDS-REM system, which stands for Medication Education, Decision Support, Reminding, and Monitoring. And we're focusing in this initial round on hypertension medicine, and we're designing it to be a coach. And so it provides a personal reminder schedule, medication-specific education. So if you go online and say hypertension medication, you get a whole bunch of them. I don't need to know about all of them. I need to know about mine. So it's very specific kind of education. And then it provides decision support in real time. So maybe because I'm at this meeting today, I forgot to take my medicine at 10.30. It's now you know, 1.15. What should I do? And it gives you guidance about what you should do. So this, too, is an interdisciplinary team. We have a nurse, a pharmacist, human factors and aging researchers, as well as people who are designing the app itself. So we're currently um, developing it. So we have a grant from the National Institute of Nursing Research. And we just had a meeting yesterday where we were talking about how to then move this forward to do a larger randomized clinical trial to look at the benefits of this kind of a system. Another project is televideo technology, and this is focusing on older adults who have mobility impairments. And we're looking at um, basically off-the-shelf technology, so technologies that are available today. Skype, this is something called the Kubi robot. It's a tabletop robot that can turn around and look at different um, perspectives. And then a mobile robot that can actually move about in space. We're interested in using these technologies for support of social connectedness as well as physical activity. And this set of studies um, has different phases. First is understanding what are people's attitudes towards these kinds of technologies, these particular people, older adults who have mobility impairments. And what are some of the usability challenges, much like we found with the extra game study and anybody that's ever had a bad Skype experience can relate to this, right? It's supposed to be easy to use, but it isn't always. And then 
Ultimately, we want to use the, one of these technologies to support group exercise at home. So having a physical therapist there, having multiple people doing a class, basically all at the same time, physical activity and social support. Again, interdisciplinary team, you see my theme here. We have human factors in aging, but also people who know exercise psychology and physical therapy. We've completed phase one, we're finishing phase two, and we're planning phase three to look at the potential for this technology. Another category is what are referred to as digital home assistant technologies, things like the Amazon Echo or the Amazon Dot. And these technologies are not specifically designed for older adults, and they don't really address their user needs very well. And so here again, we're taking a similar phased approach where we're first doing an interview study with people who currently use the Echo. What are they using it for? What do they like? What don't they like? What are some of the challenges they're experiencing? We're then going to be doing a usability assessment with novice older adults who haven't used it at all. Can they get it to do simple things, turn on the light, turn on the TV, or more complicated things? And then ultimately, we want to use this technology. It's, it's a tool, as Miranda said earlier, it's a tool to use technology for something. Well, in this case, it's to support social interaction and physical activity is what we're moving towards. And our team here is exercise psychology, also electrical engineering, and our human factors in aging group. And we're in phases one and two, we're basically doing those simultaneously and then planning a grant to be able to do phase three. So all of these, part of why I'm telling you about what we're planning is those are opportunities for collaboration. The last and this is a big category, is design of robots. So I do, I have a program of research on human-robot interaction. I don't design the robot, but I look at how can robots be used by older adults. And if we're thinking about that, we need to think about a series of questions. Well, what does the robot need to do? What do older adults want robots to do? May need to communicate with the humans in some way. Maybe it's important that it show emotions. Maybe it needs to perform specific tasks. I showed you some of the tasks older adults have difficulty with. Maybe they want the robot to perform those tasks. They have to be able to trust it if it's going to be doing things for them that are important. Appearance turns out to be super important. And what's interesting is what people want their robot to look like depends on what the robot is doing. If it's doing chores, I want it to look one way. If it's playing a game with me, I want it to look a different way. It could provide social support. And so we've been focusing right now on three different categories of robots. First is what we call a personal service robot. Um, this is a robot's name is Gatsby. And um, this is with my colleagues at Georgia Tech. So this is the Georgia Tech service bot with interactive intelligence. So it can do a lot of different things. And these are the graduate students and two of our older adult participants. One project is we're working with a fellow who has um, quadriplegia, and he's been working with us to teach the robot to help him with things that his wife used to have to help with, like shaving. Another category is social robots. So this is me with our friend Paro. Paro is a robot seal, which is adorable. And people, um, it, it reduces feelings of stress for some people. And so we're looking at the potential benefits of this kind of a relatively simple robot that can reduce feelings of stress, maybe social isolation. If you can't have a pet, could this substitute for some of the things that we get from having a pet. Third category is the one that I already mentioned, the telepresence robots. We're looking at the potential of these in a variety of situations. So here, the, somebody else is visiting the older person with their telepresence robot. In this example, this is Henry here, and he takes his robot out for a walk. He goes to mu museums. He just goes outside because he's stuck at home. So he takes the robot. So the robot can go visit the older adults, or the older adults can use the robot to go out into the world. So all of this is research in progress, again, open to collaborations. So I briefly, I have just a few minutes left. I want to talk about the importance of translation in a couple of different ways. So I talked about some of this work a few years ago when I was in China. 
And so my one slide that I just showed you was they translated my entire presentation into Chinese, which I thought was great. And so, you know, the value of being able to share our findings. So I was presenting in English, they had the slides in English, and then they had all of the slides in Chinese as well. And one of the pictures, it's not shown here, but one of the pictures was one of my graduate students FaceTiming with his grandparents. And on that slide was Sean and his grandparents and the Chinese translation. Well, his grandparents were just thrilled that they had been on the screen in China. You know, that just was an exciting opportunity for them. So related to translation, one of the things we also do is thinking about how do we translate our findings into practice? So I'm the editor of a book series, and the idea is to take everything we are learning in the more academic environments, translate that into news you can use, so to speak, for designers. So it's bulleted lists, it's guidelines, it's what to do. Very general, this one was published in 2009, we're currently working on the next edition, specific to displays, telehealth, training, and then this is the most recent one, is introducing technologies into continuing care retirement communities. Our first book was actually translated into J Japanese, so if anybody has some free time and they would like to translate it into Chinese, that would be lovely. I want to mention briefly um, part of the reason I moved, I just moved to the University of Illinois in January, to start this new program that we're calling CHART, which is Collaborations in Health, Aging, Research, and Technology. And it's at the intersection of the things that I've been talking about, healthcare, aging, human factors, and technology. And our mission statement really aligns with what I've been presenting to support successful aging through research, through technology development, also through educators, uh, education rather, of researchers and developers and healthcare professionals, influencing policy, and then translating all of these efforts to positively affect the lives of older adults. Those of you who are on campus, I just want to highlight we're going to be hosting an event here um, at the University of Illinois on November 6th. There'll be more information forthcoming, but it'll be a symposium on chart. One of the things that we're doing is we're partnering with a local um, continuing care retirement community called Clark Lindsay Village and we have what's called the chart apartment. So we're able to do research um, right there in the facility enabling older adults to interact with some of these technologies in an actual home environment. What we're planning is to build a larger home environment here at the university that we're calling the life home. So living in interactive future environments and this is going to be a multifunction space that will provide a simulated home environment for research. It will have classroom and learning event space. It will enable community involvement, industry partnerships, and collaboration with healthcare professionals. So we're very excited about this new initiative. Um, the current status is we're just finalizing the location. It will be on campus. We're getting input from people who might use the home, so different stakeholders, and we're iterating through the design. So these are just some of our initial floor plans to think about how to lay this space out, have the home part, classroom part, interaction part. So just some initial drawings of our space. So I'd like to end my remarks by just talking about a report that was put out by the White House Conference on Aging. So they talked in the report about technology for successful aging. And this was their take home message. Technology has transformed what it means to age in America. Web-based technologies, robotics, and mobile devices help older adults access the services they need, stay connected to family and friends, and remain independent. When I read that, First, I was excited that they talked about technology in this report, but then I thought, we're not there yet. They're stating this as if it's a fact, as if all these technologies that are out there are helping older adults to do all of these things. They don't do that yet. We still, we still have a lot to do. So this remains a challenge. This may be the goal, where we want to get to, 
But we have to make sure that the technology is designed to support their needs, useful and usable, efficacious in the long term. Does it really help them in some way? It needs to be integrated into the family and into healthcare and into people's lives. That's our goal, but we're not there yet. So, Shay Shay. <laughs> Any questions? Comments? Do you want to talk to us a little bit about the, the smart houses or the light house? When is that, when do you, like, what's the time frame for that? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we should be finalizing the location very soon, within the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And then the drawings that I showed you were actually started for us by a master student in architecture. So she helped us generate some ideas. Then we'll be hiring uh, professional architects to help us with the, with the layout. So I really don't know. I would say 12 to 18 months would be a reasonable estimation. And I really want to, at some point, have that specific date so we can start using that when we're writing grants and say we're going to have this facility to do research so in. Do you see design of the, of the Lighthouse as a collaborative effort as well? Oh, absolutely. So we are hosting, we've hosted events um, on campus to get input from various stakeholders on campus, but I'd be happy to talk about this this afternoon if we have time to get input from other people. One of the things that I'm planning to do is to have a visiting scholars program. So once this gets set up, people can come, spend time, and use that facility for research. Yes, sir. So that's a good question, is how to use technology also to connect families and friends. So we do have a couple of different systems that we're looking at that focus on social connectivity and social engagement. I think that's really important. Um, one relatively simple one is to make better use of Skype, which is available, teach people how to use it, and they can share you know, in, in a meal. So you can be on Skype and be having dinner with your children and, and your grandchildren. So what I try to think about in my research is how to use current technologies better at the same time as we're designing the future technologies. So do you also consider privacy issues? Yes. So privacy is a very important issue. And we've done some um, early studies about older adults' attitudes towards having technologies in their home. And what's interesting is they're, first of all, they don't always understand where the information is going. So I think part of what we have to do is make sure they're well educated about how, how their information is being shared. So some of my colleagues at Indiana University were looking at developing a display that shows you what's on at any moment in your home and where it's going. Um, the other part is the older adults are okay with sharing it if they can decide who it gets shared with. So also enabling them to maybe share it with family members. But even we had one woman say, well, I will share it with my son, but I don't want to share it with my daughter, or <laughs> vice versa. You know, So uh, giving them the control, and I think that's really important, making sure they have control over what's being done, what's being watched, and what, they can, what people can do with it. Yes? Absolutely. I'm looking around the room to see if my colleague Lynn is still here. She had to go teach. Oh, there she is. So Lynn Dearborn is doing that in the College of Architecture here at the University of Illinois. Um, with respect to the physical infrastructure and the environment, 
but also looking at um, other kinds of what you might think of as lower tech kinds of solutions that might be supportive. Um, and I think one of the things I want to do with the chart program is to learn more about what other people are doing. So I mostly talked about what we do in my lab, but to find out what are other people doing in this space and, and bring them together to talk to each other. Because you're absolutely right. There's a whole breadth of things that we could be focusing on. Yes. And if you look at things like um, different social circumstances, like whether you know uh, aging and the differences uh, in terms of either culture or uh, class issues and access to different knowledge. Very good question. We do pay attention to things like socioeconomic status and. Um, what is available in terms of technology. <coughs> also, living circumstances, people who may be at risk for social isolation. Um, we've done some research looking at urban versus rural environments. I personally have not done a, a lot yet on cultural differences, but I think they're really important. Um, when I visited Singapore a few years ago, I was talking about what US older adults wanted their robots to do, and it was very different than what the Singaporean older adults wanted their robot to do. So I think we need to pay more attention to that. Okay, let's, let's uh, thank 